My name is Anna Tomšić, and I am the Vice President of Men's Health Network, a national nonprofit organization whose mission is to reach men, boys, and their families where they live, work, play, and pray. So we, we do that through health awareness messages, disease prevention messages, and tools, screening programs, educational materials, advocacy opportunities, and patient navigation. We've spent many years working with the Bipartisan Congressional Men's Health Caucus, currently co-chaired by Representatives Donald Payne Jr. of New Jersey and uh, Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen of Oklahoma. We'd like to take a moment to thank them and the Congressional Men's Health Caucus for making this briefing possible. And we hope that um, at some point during today's uh, briefing, we will have the congressmen come and um, say a few words. So when they do, we will stop um, the presentations that we have and give them a, a few minutes to speak. So we have, um, we're honored to have you in attendance today on this briefing for first responders and the health issues that they face. We have a very distinguished panel here and to discuss a variety of topics addressing this topic. So we're going to get started um, to give them all enough time to speak. A uh, bit of housekeeping, we're going to make time for about one or two short questions after each presentation, but we will have a question and answer session at the end. So um, please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question um, of the presenters as they are up here, or uh, make sure you write it down so we can ask it at the end. Our first presenter is uh, Regina Wilson. She is a firefighter for the Depar fire department of the city of New York. She's currently assigned to engine company 219. She has been a member of the fire department for 20 years and is one of only 92 women in a workforce of over 11,000 firefighters and fire officers. Regina responded and assisted in the search and rescue and recovery of 9-11. She spent several months searching for members in her company and others who were victims of the tragedies. She also served in rescue and recovery efforts of both Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy. So we're gonna put her presentation up. Do you wanna start with the video or you wanna do an introduction? Uh, I'll just do a quick hello and then we can do okay. the video. How's everybody doing? Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be able to. Um, okay. I'm glad to be able to to be here today to uh, address everyone. Um, I'm hoping that you'll have an opportunity to learn a little bit about me and to learn a bit about what's going on in New York and uh, about women and people of color in the fire service. So uh, we're going to begin with the video, so you can just kind of figure out who I am. I was born in East Flatbush section of Brooklyn. I think I was always the type to look after everyone. Living in Brooklyn with my mom, I think it was difficult for her being a single parent. At the age of 16 is when I realized my mom had a bad drug addiction. I remember graduating from junior high school and my mom was mad at me. She ended up not coming to my graduation and later on when I got home that night, she beat me up pretty bad and dragged me by my hair across the floor. My grandmother told her that she was gonna take me with her. She bought my plane ticket and, and took me out of the house. My grandmother, Alma, made me feel really wanted. She loved us more than we probably could ever know. Losing her was one of the biggest devastations in my life. I think about it often and use that energy to make sure she's proud of me. In 1992, I went to the Javits Center and I was there for a Black Expo. A recruiter came up to me and asked me if I ever thought about becoming a New York City firefighter, and I said no. Then they started to talk about, well, you know, this would be a great, unique opportunity for you because there's not a lot of African Americans and there's not a lot of women on the job. So I, I thought, like, why not me? And why is it that they think that a woman can't do this? The first part of becoming a firefighter, I had to take a written exam. I remember sitting in my classroom getting ready to take the test, and I was surrounded by white men. I was the only black female in the room. I've never felt that much alone in my life, but I had to sit strong and know that I had to fight and know that I deserve to be here just like they did. 
were drill instructors that as soon as they came on Randall's Island, their goal was to try to break my spirit. You don't belong here. You're not fast enough. You're not strong enough. Anytime you want to leave, I'll walk you to the gate. All of those negativities just built me up. On the morning of 9-11, I was supposed to work on ladder 105. A member from 219 came in and asked me, can he switch with me because he wanted to get more truck experience? And I told him yes. We responded through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. We saw this white smoke and this white light. And then when we were walking towards the buildings, all you can hear is, we're under attack, we're under attack. I was in pitch blackness for at least like a good two minutes. Didn't know whether or not I was gonna live or die. After this experience, I know that every time I leave the firehouse, I could potentially not come back. I have to make sure that the gift of time that has been given to me is not wasted. The department has to really look at some of the patterns of racial and gender discrimination that they've had for so many years and break down that barrier and that wall. Because if you don't, this department is good, but it would never be great. me when people in general say women aren't strong enough, men have the most upper body strength, just let me pull you out, save your life, and then you can determine whether or not I did the best job once you're alive because I came in the building to save your life. So hopefully that was a little um, look into my life and uh, get a brief view of who I am. Uh, but I wanted to share with you a little bit of information about 9-11 because we've actually been going through a lot since um, that uh, tragic day. I uh, wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about my experience. Um, how I could best um, describe what I went through during that day is... Um, having the feeling of submission of death, not knowing what you're gonna live or die, but knowing you were dying with a purpose. So I've never felt, as, as scary as it is, I, I felt strength in knowing that if I died tomorrow, if I, I, if I died in that moment, that I would die doing something that I love and I was passionate about. So life in itself meant everything to me in that moment because I, I felt like I would leave with no regrets. And all of those people that were there that day felt the same way because nobody went home. And even those that died during 9-11, they went up there with the same passion and goal to know that they had to do their job and their job was sacrificing and dying to make sure that someone else lived. So that experience is the purest form of my job that I think I've, I've felt since I've, I've been on the job. And I've been on the job for 20 years now. So the realness of who we are as first responders is, is, is that moment for me right there. And it explains it all to me. So these women actually on the bottom were all women that responded to 9-11 in different capacities. Some of them are EMT, some of them are police officers, some of them uh, worked in different states. And the woman on the top was a New York City uh, police officer and she passed away during 9-11. And actually is the last photo that she took helping someone before she 
actually died. So this picture, I wanted really all of you to see the women that were there because women themselves are written out of the story of 9-11. And you would not think that any woman participate in the rescue and recovery of 9-11. But we were there. We stood strong. We stood next to our brother firefighters. And we wanted to make sure that we were a standing strong point in making sure that people know that we care just like anyone else. Because bravery doesn't have a face. It's a desire and a passion in your heart. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my experience as a uh, ceremonial unit member. So this braid that I have on me right now means that I'm in that unit. And in that unit, I continuously experience 9-11. And, and this is something that people were like, well, why are you still there if you still have to keep going through it? It's because this moment of 9-11 is going to be with me for the rest of my life. So I can't give up on those people that were there that are still sacrificing to this day. So what you're seeing here is a lot of the ceremonies that we go to and a lot of our brothers and sister firefighters, police officers, sanitation, MTA, all come out to help to celebrate and to uh, the life of those that have died. But we have so many firefighters right now and EMS workers that are passing away from 9-11 related illnesses. So I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of the stats from it. So um, 23 police officers were killed during the World Trade Center in 2011. Since then, the NYPD stated that 156 have died of illnesses that came from them being on the pile and um, you know breathing in a lot of those toxins from the fallen building. Among firefighters, 343 died from New York City and 194 have died from 9-11 related illnesses. And we're still to this day as a unit of the ceremonial unit are going to funerals. So not only are we going to funerals, but a year after you have to go to the plaque dedication or you have to go to street renaming. So being able to experience all of that and dealing with the families and their trauma and um, all of the things that they go through, we still have to relive it. It feels like almost every day. Also, according to the FBI, federal agents have also seen a recent increase in the number of killed by 9-11 related illnesses, including 15 FBI agents. So it's, we're suffering um, you know, in all different agencies in alarming rates. And um, we're, with, we're, with the 9-11 um, police officers and firefighters, we believe that we're going to surpass those numbers of people that died during the Trade Center from people that died during World Trade Center related illnesses. So some of the aftermath, um, according to the FDNY, over 2,100 firefighters and EMS personnel have retired with disability related to World Trade Center illnesses. They have lung diseases and cancers that are unexplainable. Um, research have found thyroid, colon, prostate, um, blood cancers are more prevalent for people that work down at, at ground zero. More than 7,000 firefighters and EMTs have been treated for 9-11 um, illnesses and injuries, which we're still doing to this day. Over 3,700 members have been diagnosed with mental health, stress-related conditions, myself included. Uh, 11,000 firefighters and EMS 9-11 responders have, have been certified as 9-11 related cancers. So people are still uh, dealing with a lot of these cancers. There's actually a female firefighter that retired that has particles of cement in the bottom of her lungs that will never come out. I'll talk a little bit about uh, women's health in the fire service because some of those things are, are at an alarming rate and we really need to try and focus on that. A lot of the studies are more di um, going towards men and they're not looking at to women in the fire service. So in San Francisco, they have 225, which is the largest amount of women across the country. Uh, among 40 to 50 year olds, female firefighters, their, their breast cancer uh, rates are at an alarming rate. So 50% have been diagnosed with breast cancer out of those numbers. 75% uh, of women firefighters in the US and Canada have reported that they don't have access to specific personal protective equipment, which is the truth. Like you don't have gloves that fit, your face piece don't fit properly, um, your, your bunker coat gear. So if you don't have the, pr the, the protective gear that's gonna cover you properly, all those toxins can enter your body, which are making them more sick. But what happens is a lot of times you go into the, the firehouses and they just tell you, you know, you just have to wear whatever's here. And it doesn't really help us when it's time for us to fight off those uh, toxic chemicals. And previous studies have identified high rates of cancer. 
Um, we have muscular uh, injuries, post-traumatic distress, and um, suicide among female firefighters. So I'm not sure if you all are aware that in 2016 there was a female firefighter in Fairfax that committed suicide because of bullying. And um, those post-traumatic and those uh, bullying and hazing are something that women deal with all the time as long as well as sexual harassment and discrimination. We just recently had a battalion chief that was a wildland fire chief that just resigned. Um, uh, it was uh, Battalion Chief Bolt. Uh, she wrote a long letter describing her treatment into the wildland fire service. She did uh, many years of service but could no longer deal with the discrimination amongst women in the fire fire service. Um, let me tell you a little bit about New York. So 7.3% um, of all firefighters in, um, the, uh, in the U.S., is, is that's the percentage of it, and we've doubled in the past 15 years. So our numbers are starting to come up, but not fast enough for me, of course. Um, some cities are low, uh, low as 1%. Um, the fire department of New York is 0.5%, um, so we're not even a percentage at all. And um, also, like I said before, some of the studies are skewed towards men, so it's hard for us to figure out what some of the needs are, especially for mental health for women. Um, some of the other issues we have in reference to women and people of color are PTSD, and I was glad to read today that Connecticut is now allowing police officers and firefighters to claim PTSD. Um, we have superhero syndrome, which means that we think you know, we can go through life and not ask for help because um, we're seen as superheroes and is considered to be weak. Um, fear of retaliation, the suicide rates in fire service is high. Um, we've had more people commit suicide than people died in line of duty. Um, we're also dealing with a lot of discrimination and sexual harassment. So what can you do to help? Some of the things you could do is continue to support funding and legislations that will support health needs and concerns for first responders and their family, which we really, really need. Continue to conduct studies related to women and people of color, mental and physical health. Implement necessary changes from the study to make a better working environment. And create legislations where we will continue to conduct wellness checks and, and progress our uh, reports of fire departments across the country and make sure that they're held accountable. So don't just do the studies and find the outcome. Hold them accountable to the changes that need to be made because if they're not, if, if it doesn't help and it doesn't change and the department isn't willing to change, we'll, we'll go nowhere. So I just wanted to show you some links, some information that you could look into to see some of the studies that have been done. We definitely need more and some of the issues that I brought up today to just kind of get a look and an insight of how things are done in the fire service. All right, and I want to thank you all for your support. Do we have any quick questions for Regina Wilson? Yes. Uh, Regina, I had read a little something about you have written your obituary, or I, I heard this story, and I want to hear this story. Okay, well, the story was, um, the video you saw was a four-minute video. They cut it up. Um, it is an eight-minute video. So at the end of the eight, well, the beginning of the video, I said um, I wanted to have the baddest obituary ever. So by the time my life is over, you're going to have to, like, flip through books like, dang, what does she do now? Oh, my God. Like, that, that's, that's my life. That's what I want my life to be. So that's what that means. <laughs> Okay, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, the next speaker is uh, Allison Sira. She's representing Oncology Nursing Society today and is an emergency department nurse at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital here in DC. She leads a hospital-wide council focused on advocacy, legislation, and health policy. A strong proponent of using her voice, she advocates on Capitol Hill for patients, nursing research, and nursing education. Thank you, and thank you to Ms. Wilson for that incredible testimony for first responders. Um, I wanted to thank the people that asked me to come speak here today, the Congressional Men's Caucus, Congressman Mullen, Congressman Payne, the Men's Health Network, and the Oncology Nursing Society for allowing me to speak. My name is Allison Sira, and I am a nurse. I'm proud to be among the three million nurses currently working in the United States. 
As nurses, we have the utmost respect for our first responders in the field, helping keep our community safe. First responders and nurses are linked together in the essential chain of teamwork to protect and save the lives of our community. And we owe them and the sacrifices that they make at large a large thank you. As we touch on the hazards facing our first responders in the field, I also wanted to make you aware of the hazards facing our first responders in the hospital. Working for the last four years in critical care and the emergency department here in Washington, DC, I, um, it has been some of the most rewarding and difficult times of my life. But I was drawn to this profession with that same deep desire to relieve suffering for the people in my community. As, the ER, as an ER nurse, I have the privilege of caring for people during their most raw and terrifying days of their lives. And this is not a responsibility nurses take lightly. In almost all cases, a nurse was there when you breathed your first breath. And in almost all cases, a nurse will be there when you take your last breath. We serve as the largest provider of, health, of the healthcare workforce, three million strong throughout the United States. Not only are nurses the largest healthcare work healthcare provider workforce, but we spend the highest ratio of time with our patients at the bedside. The TV media, like Grey's Anatomy, does not de depict the reality that of critical nurses as first responders. We are the ones administering that crucial dose of epinephrine. We're the ones with our hands on the chest providing CPR. We're the ones racing to start your intravenous line when you're desperate for fluids. Many times it is a nurse who notices the smallest change in a patient's condition and that subtle downturn, that noticing that subtle downturn will most likely save a life. Due to our closeness with our patients, we also absorb much of the emotion in this current situation they are in. But that emotion is not always positive, and too often that, neg that negative emotion gets directed toward the very people that are serving you. My second day in working in the emergency room, I witnessed a coworker get punched in the face by a patient. When Molly, a nurse, went to go educate her patient on why he wasn't receiving a higher dose of pain medication, he wound up and struck her in the head. She had broken teeth and required stitches. She fell to the ground. Molly, that happened on a Saturday morning, and Molly reported for work on Thursday as she was scheduled. She came back to that same ER as a because she, she was passionate that nursing is something that she was going to devote her life to. And she knew that um, she wanted to, she, her dedicated, <laughs> dedication to nursing is why she came back. But my question to you today is, did that happen, have to happen to Molly? These situations are not isolated to the emergency department. Up on our intensive care unit, a terminal patient was passing away. Emma, the nurse taking care of that terminal patient, um, was cornered in the patient's room and yelled at by an enraged family member who accused her of killing their loved one. Emma was trapped in that room with no chance of exit until a staff member intervened. In many cases across the country, nurses like Emma have not been so lucky. Incidences like these are not isolated. Between 2011 and 2016, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that 58 hospital workers died as a result of violence at their, in their workplaces, 58. Healthcare workers in inpatient facilities are five to 12 times more likely to get injured than workers overall. Those statistics do not account for all the situations that go unreported and underreported. Violence against healthcare workers happens at large and small institutions, both rural and urban. Too many times, patients and families are taking out their suffering in violent and inappropriate ways. With drug and opioid use on the rise in our country, we can safely predict that incidences like these will only increase unless we take action. 
As you gathered, I do not have a 25-year resume of nursing experience. Yet, in just my four short years as a nurse, two of these events have already occurred in my personal life. I would make the case that in most careers, we'll never experience or see incidences like these. But what, what lies in store for the future of our nursing profession if these things continue? A profession that so desperately needs to attract more to its ranks. This epidemic of violence must be addressed. Currently, there is a bill, HR 1309, the Workplace Violence Prevention for Healthcare and Social Service Workers Act. This bill requires that employers develop and implement a comprehensive plan for protecting their work healthcare workers from workplace violence. Through HR 1309, employers would be mandated to investigate workplace violence incidents and provide trainings for employees that might be exposed to violence. I'm lucky because recently my hospital has instituted a mandatory workplace violence prevention program. And as an employee that's put in high risk situations in the emergency room every day, I feel more empowered and supported by that, my institution to combat these realities. But I do shudder to think about hospitals all across the country, large and small, urban and rural, that do not have these same protections. And so today I'm standing up and advocating on behalf of them. As nurses, we are a link in the critical chain of emergency response. Many times we are overworked and understaffed, depending on the volume of human tragedy un unfolding before us. But like first responders, we must be there, at the ready, when you need us most. So this is a moment where we need you. You have the opportunity to strengthen and protect first responders by supporting HR 1309. By doing so, your motivation becomes one with ours to protect and to save lives. Thank you. Um, we do have Congressman Payne Jr. who has joined us, so we will welcome um, Congressman Payne Jr. to come up here and say a few words. Thank you. Uh, and when she said a couple seats, she meant two. <laughs> this is quite a packed house. Uh, it's a real honor and privilege to be here today. And I want to thank all of you for being here today. And today is important for briefing on, briefing on health hazards faced by the nation's first responders. Together uh, with my friend, uh, Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen, we co-chair the Congressional Men's Health Caucus. Today we have an opportunity to learn from the experts about first responders and health hazards, including the state of health for people who are on the ground in the aftermath of 9-11's terrorist attacks. As we all know, first responders are on the scene for fires, floods, uh, and disasters, whether they be man-made or natural. And uh, as the chairman of the um, Emergency Preparedness Response and Communications uh, Committee uh, on Homeland Security, uh, first responders uh, and these issues around um, man-made and natural disasters come under my purview. Uh, in their life-saving work, first responders sometimes come into contact with hazardous substances, things like asbestos or lead from burning buildings, benzene or volatile organic compounds from chemical spills and viruses or microbes uh, from blood floodwaters. Uh, today's briefing will help us better understand uh, the hazards facing first responders so that Congress and public health experts can ensure our first responders have access to the care they need. And I'm really proud to be here with you and learning about these, these uh, circumstances. 
Um, my job in Congress is to make sure first responders have the training and the equipment that they need to be safe in order to keep all of us safe. And so I will continue in that effort. Thank you very much. is going to be from Dr. Elizabeth Whalen. She received her PhD in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and joined NIOSH as an epidemic intelligent as an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer at the same time. Dr. Whalen has over 25 years experience conducting occupational epidemiology studies and her research interests include re reproductive health, take home exposures, occupational cancer, and emergency response research. Dr. Whalen. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. And I want to introduce my colleague, Dr. Kenny Fent, who's with me as well. We are both um, commissioned officers in the US Public Health Service, uh, working for the Surgeon General, assigned to NIOSH. So a lot of tie-in with these um, two talks. We study both firefighters and nurses. So um, I'm here to today to talk a little bit about the firefighter safety and research program that we have going on. So just a brief outline, I'm going to touch on a little bit of background and then six different topics that relate to our work on first responder research. So why are we studying firefighters? I think that's pretty obvious from Regina's um, presentation, but uh, we know that firefighters are exposed to hundreds of different chemicals, including several that are known carcinogens. And certainly they're exposed to shift work and sleep disruption and psychosocial stressors. We know that they're at an increased risk of several cancers and also acute cardio cardiovascular events are the leading cause of line of duty deaths. And yet fire characteristics have changed due to the increasing amounts of um, synthetic materials. So the fires are different these days than they were decades ago. Uh, things burn faster and longer and different chemicals are involved. So just a word to start off on our firefighter exposure and personal protective equipment research. Um, we have a collaboration underway with the Illinois Fire Service Institute and Underwriters Labs to characterize firefighters' absorption of toxicants during residential fires and training fires. So here we're trying to answer the questions, how do these exposures vary by job assignment and attack tactics, and what is the relative effect effectiveness of different control measures? So here's some findings that uh, have come out of this work. Um, field decontamination of turnout gear results in an 85% reduction in contamination. Using skin cleansing wipes, like this particularly on the neck, uh, results in a 54% results reduction in contamination. Laundering of the hoods that go underneath the firefighter helmets um, can reduce a lot of contaminants. They, a lot are, are extracted during laundering, but some are not, like the important ones like flame, flame retardants. Um, transporting dirty gear outside the fire truck cab instead of inside prevents unnecessary exposure to carcinogens. And then the attack method, whether it's transitional starting from the outside going in or just going in right at the start, can um, result in a 50% reduction in uptake of certain chemical products. So we're also doing some validation studies of how clean is clean, um, thinking about cleaning procedures for, for the personal protective equipment. Some of these general guidelines exist, but could certainly be refined with more research. So the stakeholder questions are, how clean is clean, and how do I know if my gear is clean? And so some of our work at NIOSH is creating a portable kit that will help determine whether the equipment has been cleaned effectively or not. And then as everyone is dealing with these days, opioids are a national crisis, and our work certainly relates to that as far as first responders go. So this is our kind of framework for studying opioids at NIOSH. And um, obviously protecting workers and responders is, is um, of great interest to us. So our um, health hazard evaluation program has done 14 different investigations assessing hazards to emergency responders and other groups of workers exposed to these compounds. We found that the ill effects were related to work activities and they certainly impacted their ability to perform their job duties. And we have some issued some guidance um, preventing occupational fentanyl exposure to emergency responders. And then of course our World Trade Center Health Program. Um, so this program provides monitoring and treatment benefits to those workers involved with rescue, recovery, and cleanup 
um, during the 9-11 attacks, as well as people who were in working and living in that area. So, so far we have over 95,000 members enrolled, 75,000 of those are responders across nearly every congressional district. Um, the program provides care for World Trade Center related health conditions, such as various cancers, traumatic injuries, and mental health conditions. Um, the care is provided through the Clinical Centers of Excellence in New York City, New Jersey, and through the Nationwide Provider Network. And that um, bill has been authorized and funded through FY 2090. We also investigate firefighter fatalities, line of duty deaths. Um, so our program is funded by Congress in 1998 to address these fatalities. These are independent investigations of line of duty deaths that do not find fault or place blame, but rather are looking at risk factors for these events. So we categorize them as either medical or traumatic injury. Um, about 700 have been completed since April, 400 of those are traumatic injury related. And of course the goal is to learn from these investigations um, with the ultimate goal to prevent these injuries and deaths. We also have a study underway on wildland firefighters. Um, this study is, you know, as a result of basically the increasing wildland fire season. Um, more acreage is being burned by wildfires and suppression costs are increasing. So this study um, is following six different crews over three years for a total of 120 firefighters. And this is kind of a deep dive into um, assessing changes in lung function, cardiovascular function, kidney function, and hearing loss and trying to decide and evaluate whether these changes can be would, are acute or if they last or chronic effects. And then finally, our most recent effort um, is the National Firefighter Registry. We wanted to tell you about, this is just starting. So the purpose of the registry, this was a, um, a law that was signed last July, uh, the Firefighter Cancer Registry Act. And um, based on prior studies, some of them that were done by us at NIOSH, um, found increasing rates of cancer, but as Regina pointed out, there are very few studies looking at women and minorities and volunteer firefighters. So the goal of the registry is to track firefighter cancer risk over time to better understand the link. And then with a particular interest we have in um, what those remaining questions, what is the cancer risk for minorities, for female firefighters, for volunteers who actually represent most of the firefighters in the country? And then we um, have some interest in looking at other subgroups, such, such as wildland firefighters and perhaps arson investigators. So we're interested in how does this cancer risk vary? As I said, there, the materials that are burning are different, and there's increasing exposure to synthetic materials. Um, with adoption of different control measures, how does that work? How effective is it at reducing the risk of cancer? Um, how does cancer risk vary geographically? And then with increasing exposure. So this is the timeline for the registry. Uh, we're currently in year one, 2019, and we're just starting to um, uh, solicit input on the registry. We have a, a request for information published in the Federal Register. It's two more weeks to provide input. Um, and then we'll move through identifying sampling methods. In year two through four, we'll be re starting our recruitment, obtaining consent, then matching with state cancer registry records to determine cancer incidence updating as necessary, and then disseminating our findings in year five and beyond. So just a word that the RFI is open for another two weeks, as I said, and we're really happy to be sharing information about the new registry and happy to take questions. So Beth, I think you yeah. should mention that the registry is for all firefighters. So Absolutely. Cancer be in the registry. Right. Yeah. And just be clear, that includes volunteer Yes. Yes, that's a, a specific target for us, yeah. Yeah. Um, are inmates who are firefighters in California for the wildfires? I'm sorry, I can, I'm sorry, I can hear you. Are inmate firefighters ah. included in the registry? So we haven't really discussed that yet, actually. Um, that's a good question. We'll have to give that some thought. We're getting other different subpopulations questions about that. We haven't talked about that one yet. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, our next presentation is Colonel Doctor. Is it Doctor Colonel? Doc, Colonel Doctor? Uh, David Gremion. 
He is a Louisiana native and attended LSU School of Medicine prior to completing 20 years in the U.S. Air Force. During his Air Force years, he was Infectious Diseases Fellowship Director at Wilford, Wilford Hall Medical Center. He served as President of the Society of Air Force Physicians and Consultant to the Air Force Surgeon General for Infectious, infectious Diseases. And he currently serves as one of the uh, Board of Directors of Men's Health Network. So we're very happy to have him here today. Thank you, Alex. And thanks to my panel uh, members here for their wonderful presentations. I'll point out that the ratio is three to one, women to men. <laughs> Thank you. This is gonna be a little bit unorthodox. My goal is to expand on what uh, Congressman Payne mentioned. If you listened carefully, microbes. Microbes are a huge risk for first responders. But that risk pales when you think of all of the other things that they're exposed to. So what I plan to do is to cover some things that are going to be innovative. I'll actually look at current problems like measles, some things like the Zika virus, MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. And in the course of that, I'll talk about some policy-related issues that can make a really big difference for some of our first responders. The first thing is a first responder that you may not know was a first responder, but his story tells an amazing uh, caveat for our current first responders. This is Michel de Nostradam, better known as Nostradamus, who was an advisor to the Medici family back in the 1500s. Many people know that he became a, a fortune teller of sorts, but what many people do not know, I learned recently, is that he was a first responder. This is a portrait from life by his son, Caesar, but this is his second family. He lost his first family in the plague of 1534. His young wife and two children all were killed with plague. He did not have the plague because uh, he had um, protective gear, personal protective gear. And um, you'll be very surprised to see the personal protective gear. Uh, this is maintained in some museums in France. Um, basically, these individuals wore a leather cape, a waxed cotton uh, smock with heavy gloves, as you see, heavy shoes, and this rather bizarre and intimidating uh, mask. And this bizarre and intimidating mask had a unique function. Now, Nostradamus did not realize that he was filtering bacteria. He didn't do it for that purpose. There were two small holes at the uh, end of this uh, beak, but the beak was filled with rose petals, myrrh, various types of perfumes. The goal of it was to allow him to enter a room as a first responder and deal with the smell. The stick was actually to move his clothing aside so he could see the buboes, the large decaying pieces of flesh. And this is the gear that um, he would have worn during that 1534 epidemic. Unknown to him, it was contaminated. He took it back to his family and they all died of the plague. He lived with that for his, the rest of his life. Now, from the museum in Avion, France, is an actual uh, representation of that personal protective gear you were talking about. And uh, I think it's fascinating that we have these examples from 500 years ago. Now, there is this odd misconception that Nostradamus could look into the future and identify how to protect one from the risks that they were currently experiencing, and he made a lot of money off the Medici family by doing that. But I'm not so sure that he could not look into the future. If you look at this gentleman, he has a beak-like uh, mask, a heavy leather smock, and so it is curious. <laughs> so another first responder that um, I'll share with you that's a kind of an important one is the white blood cell, plain old simple white blood cell. 
This white blood cell's an amazing, uh, uh, a fierce fighter. They don't know what they're doing. They've just been summoned to the scene by something called uh, chemokines, chemotactic agents, that ask for reinforcements. So that when your doctor does a white cell count on your uh, blood, what they're looking for is the call for reinforcements. The white uh, blood cell has shown up there. They're a fierce fighting machine. They don't know why they're there. It's completely unknown risk. They only know that there's something trying to harm their host, their person. So if you could magically take this white cell and grow them to human size, it would be the fiercest fighting entity on the planet, like a SEAL Team 6 entering the room. If I were a bacteria, the SEAL Team, the white cell would begin to throw little water balloons like my grandkids do, throw water balloons at me, trying to kill me with something called leukocyte esterase. It wouldn't work. So what would it do? The surface of this white cell is real sticky. It would snuggle up to me, stick to me, and slowly eat me. It's called engulfment or phagocytosis. Then it would begin to take my body apart so that it could analyze my body for the second wave uh, responders. These second wave responders are lymphocytes, mast cells, eosinophils. They're highly specialized, but they're also protected and they last for the rest of your life. So when you get that measles shot, which is a skin injury, white cells show up, they say, oh darn, don't worry about it, it's nothing big, it's not strep. The mast cells begin to show up. The lymphocytes begin to show up and they say, this is interesting. The body parts of what we found there need to be remembered in case this disease comes along again. So then those antibodies stay with you for the rest of your life, unlike the first responder. The first responder has high risk, short lifespan. They're very dangerous. They do as much damage to the body, to the host, uh, as they do to the invading bacteria. But they're functioning without a full threat assessment, if you follow me. The, they are doing the threat assessment for the follow-on second and third wave that are much better prepared. So two messages from these two bizarre pathways to stories. Number one, first responders, when they're worried about infection, they have to also worry about infection for their families. And each of the three examples I'm going to show you are infection syndromes put, that put first responders at risk in which they can take it home to their family. I selected these just for that purpose. So first of all, what are the characteristics of the first responder experience? First of all, the risks are unknown. Think of invisible. You know, you go to a scene of a tragedy, an accident, a terrorist attack. You're looking at what's visible. You're thinking about what's there, but what may be the greatest risk is what's invisible, what's microscopic. There are changing risks. This time last year, we didn't even think about measles as a risk for a first responder. Last week, there were 758 cases of measles. We're in the biggest measles epidemic in 25 years. That is a risk for first responders. You'll see why in just a minute. There are secondary risk factors for first responders, not just for, as I mentioned, not just for the first responder, but that secondary risk is to workmates and to family members. They have to act just like that poor white cell with no threat assessment. The white cell flows in there, they're fighting, they want to do a good job, and they end up killing a lot of things they shouldn't kill, but they do that job, and sometimes they kill themselves. The risk is high, but the urgency to act is also high. <clears throat> there is a high risk of personal injury uh, with first responders. We've heard it from Regina, from the experiences that she described. We've heard it from uh, Allison with violence against uh, healthcare workers that are first responders. And we heard it from Beth with her presentation. There is a high risk of injury for uh, first responders. They carry that risk with them every place they go. They do it for us. 
Can you imagine a world without first responders? Our sense of freedom would be very constrained, wouldn't it? Because each day we live our lives with that realization that somebody's got our back. You know, we can do something adventuresome, something exciting. We can think and act outside of the box. But we can only do that because we know somebody's got our back. And that's where we come in as uh, public officials and voters. We have to let our first responders know that we have their back as well. And that's our job here today. <clears throat> <laughs> She wrote that for me. I just uh, <laughs> had trouble reading her handwriting. Uh, high levels of stress. Um, Regina did not emphasize this, but one of the key issues that we're learning about post-traumatic stress disorder and its lifelong impact on the individual who has experienced it is that it's devastating. But again, it's taken back to the family. The PTSD experienced by the first responder becomes a family issue. It becomes a workplace issue. It becomes a lifelong issue. But progress is being made very rapidly. And aftercare support issues. Now by aftercare support, um, I'm referring again too many times to your presentation, but uh, when you refer to 9-11, a huge amount of money was created to care for what they thought would be a relatively and slowly declining uh, need for health care and support, uh, ranging from mental through infectious disease and other things. But as you've pointed out, the story has changed since that original legislation passed. The story has changed. We now hear there are people with cement in the bottom of their lungs. We hear of 1,500 cases of cancer that have no other explanation than what they experienced. So the priority for that initial funding and the initial wisdom of granting it has changed. It has changed because of the dynamic of what has happened and the observations since. We're lucky to have people like this to bring that uh, to groups and to congressmen like Payne who's committed to this issue. <clears throat> Aftercare support issues, we need more. So how does the system, by system I mean the federal government, local government, even volunteer, uh, volunteers that are supported by their communities, what are these, the characteristics of that first responder experience are severe and they require personnel policies that are appropriate. First of all, in the military we had a flight crew rest. Uh, period. You cannot fly. You can't jump in that F-15 unless you have had eight hours of shut-eye. We need to have personnel policies that are adaptive, that are appropriate to the situation that first responders are going to encounter. You can't take a firefighter, and you mentioned, I'm happy to hear it, the Wildlands Firefighter Program. And what happens with the wildland firefighters is that they rush into, they're deeply committed to uh, getting things done, but they stay way too long without relief. And that fatigue becomes an issue in their effectiveness. So the firefighters, all of the first responders, need to have crest, uh, crew rest policies, paid downtime for exposure. If you run into a, a room with a measles case, you have to see if you have antibodies that are protecting you, and that comes in the aftercare two, three days later when you talk to somebody about it. Your antibodies are a little bit low. You're out of work for a week or two until that incubation period says, okay, go back to work. So there are downtime issues and payment issues to that individual you don't take it as vacation time. You maybe do some training, but you actually need to have compensation for that time. And training during allotted compensation time, often at the workplace. Aftercare and long-term follow-up, of course, and funding with healthcare policies that go beyond the deductibles issues that we're seeing everywhere throughout society. 
deductibles, copays. You may think you have health insurance until you just decide to go use it. And I have had many patients come to me in my clinic and say, Doc, I have health insurance, but I don't want to use it <laughs> because their copay is so high. So our first responders, if we are going to live by that mantra that we've got your back, if we're going to live by it, the first step is providing health care that is comprehensive to them and to their families. And that would also include uh, life insurance as well. Am I okay on time? Okay. I'm going to talk about modes of spread of infectious diseases. Now, there are many famous ones not here, like sexual, uh, spread by mosquitoes, ticks. They're not listed here because, in general, they have no relevance to the EFR, emergency first response experience. But all of them can be categorized under the acronym three Ws, the three Ws, wound, water, and wind. With wound, you could find things like contact, skin, sores, injuries. Under water, all of those body fluids, amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid might be a, a route for Zika virus. Uh, blood, saliva, water, wound, water, wind, droplet, aerosol spread, tuberculosis. Uh, if you are rushing to a scene, you're breathless with how fast you're having to carry all this protective gear, breathing deeply in and out, wound, water, wind, wound, water, wind. It'll help you remember what to watch for and think about and uh, as you enter that uh, scene. Some pathogens by mode of spread. Contact, of course, MRSA, methicillin-resistant resi Staph aureus, anthrax, uh, which can be a bioweapon, but it can also be a naturally acquired infectious process, herpes, is a, a risk for first responders. Airborne spread with aerosol, you would look at pathogens like tuberculosis, measles, varicella chickenpox, additional pathogens by mode of spread, uh, HIV, hepatitis B and C, and Zika. I'll speak about Zika in just a moment. Uh, waterborne, you would look at hepatitis A, Shigella, Salmonella, and norovirus. Now you think of norovirus as some simple thing, but if a first responder gets norovirus and diarrhea for a week, they're no longer uh, backing us up. And so they have unique issues that derive directly from the risks that they took to protect us. And societally, we have that reciprocal obligation, and we can't get away from it. It's there. We can't get away from it. Now, you've read in the papers that we're in a 25-year historic uh, rubiola or measles epidemic. And this uh, should be recognized by everyone except that you've never seen it in your life. So I decided to show you a measles face. The measles rash starts right here at the headline, hairline, and it descends like a window shade across the face. There's always redness to the whites of the eyes, coryza, and cough. There are many things that may look like this, like a drug reaction, etc. But exposure to measles is quite a serious event. This current epidemic is uh, centered in California, around Disneyland, but it's actually everywhere in the country now. So a first responder may enter a home of a child with a temp of 106 who just had a fever and look at that child and see, gosh, there's a rash here. What's going on? Could it be meningococcus? Could it be measles? Uh, if you can recognize that rash and the tiny little spots inside the mouth called coplic spots, you're going to go a long ways in helping to protect your community. Gaps in immunization are a critical issue. And as first responders, uh, you are uh, leaders in the community. You're leaders in thought, you're leaders in attitudes, and one of those that you can make a difference in, and everybody in this room for that matter, is to dispel this myth that there's some problem with immunizations. Immunizations really do save lives uh, dramatically. And we're talking about an immunization here with a 99% effectiveness rate. That's rare in clinical medicine. From this recent study, 
one in five children with measles in Southern California had to be admitted for the severity of their disease. One in 15 developed serious complications like pneumonia, otitis media, or other complication. Immunization is prevalent in some narrow pockets of community that have either rejected immunization, that have e measles immunization has been rejected by them or it has not been available to them. There are those two different pathways to not having adequate immunization. The implications for emergency first responders are first of all that you recognize it. You recognize it to protect yourself and so that you don't do like Nostradamus did and take it back home to your family. Immunizations for yourself and for others and avoidance of downtime, duty restrictions based upon the fact that you were exposed. And a potential EFR exposure uh, could come in any form. It may be a seizure as I described. It may be you entering the home for a totally different purpose as a response and seeing a rash that you needed to report to someone. Next, we'll talk about flavivirus uh, or Zika. Now you say, how could this possibly fit into a first responder profile? Well, Zika, as you know, is primarily spread by Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus that are now becoming more prevalent farther north. However, what we've learned in the past couple of years is that it's spread by sex, sexual intercourse and it's spread by amniotic fluid. And so an emergency responder responding to an out of hospital delivery, an emergency delivery, might have amniotic fluid exposure. And that Zika virus could produce some things that are very significant, not only to the exposed individual, who as you see here, only one in four will have any symptoms at all. And those symptoms that you see on the blue chart are often very mild when they do have them. They'll not recognize them. But by getting that Zika virus, you will carry that back potentially to a spouse. Or if you're a female responder, you may independently acquire that Zika virus and uh, place your child at some significant risk of either Guillain-Barre syndrome or uh, microcephaly. So it is not commonly appreciated that it's spread by other than mosquitoes. Um, I'm skipping forward just a bit here to finish up within two minutes. Some of the mitigation strategies have already been discussed. I'll not spend a lot of time on them. I will tell you there are a lot of very good people working on that new technology. It can be very expensive. It can be difficult to use properly. Taking off a glove, as Allison knows where. Well, it has to be done very carefully this way. Pull it out so that you encapsule whatever is exposed on the hand. Many people don't know that or do it properly. So degloving and in fact donning and doffing all personnel protective equipment has to be taught and rehearsed and done over and over and over again. Um, now I will refer just briefly to this. Um, Beth, Dr. Whalen referred to the opioid epidemic and its, its implications. What we've realized recently is that not only do we have a heroin epidemic, we have a fentanyl epidemic and now a carfentanyl epidemic. Carfentanyl is 10 times more powerful than fentanyl and fentanyl is 100 times more powerful. In these vials are the lethal dose of each of those agents. And as you can see, a simple, uh, a simple hand contact or reaching up and touching your eye, a mucous membrane, could transfer a lethal amount of carfentanil. And in fact, it is very common now, one case in North Carolina just two weeks ago, of first responder workmates along with them having to give Narcan to one of the first responders. It all comes from the lack of a threat assessment. You don't know what's going on at that scene that you've just entered. If fentanyl is there, it introduces a whole lot of new issues that have to be taken into consideration. 
immunization, get your shots when you can, is critically important, and encourage other, other people just through the force of your understanding and knowledge to adopt a healthy attitude toward immunization. Prophylactic antibiotics, we use them all the time in first responders. Post-exposure follow-up, work limitations, these are all things. Now we've switched, because of the opioid thing, to nitrile gloves that are powerful, strong, and impervious to that fentanyl. Um, rapidly changing personal protective equipment. Again, I know that this is Dr. Whalen's area of expertise, but the area of expertise that I'm seeing in the teenagers is that it is becoming a fashion industry. I don't know if you know this, but in medicine we've addressed this for years where people really like the look of the scrubs. The scrub suits really look good. And if you want to if you want to go out and impress people with your scrubs, but as an infectious disease doc, I look at that and I say, where have you been <laughs> that you needed scrubs? Have you been in an OR? Um, and actually, if you look at tactical gear, if you go to Cabela's now and you can find tactical gear that is not really worn for any purpose than a fashion. There's a huge fashion industry developing around personal protective gear. Not the mask, by the way. That hasn't caught on yet. So wearing, the CDC has a specific rule against wearing in public, and I would encourage you to, uh, to take, take that to heart. Personal protect, protective equipment is often taught uh, with a module. They say give you a manual, take this home, read it carefully at home, and you'll take your test tomorrow. That's no good. You need to be compensated for that time when you are at home working hard to uh, get up to speed. So, Nostradamus was right, without a doubt, about protective gear. I don't know how he could look forward and see this goof bean thing that stuck out, but he maybe did. <laughs> and also, there are risks that first responders take every day on our behalf. Those risks have been described by the people at this table, and I've amplified on that a little bit by talking to you about bugs, germs that are risks not only for the individual, but in the three cases I mentioned, Zika, MRSA, measles, you're putting your family at risk by the job we, we ask you to do. And we have an obligation. That obligation to our first responders derives from the obligation and the commitment they've made to us. We have an obligation to back them up. They have our back and we have to have theirs. Thank you. Well, thank you. Do we have any uh, questions for Dr. Gremion or in general? Okay, so um, do you want to sit down, Dr. Gremion, and then we'll do open it up for um, the panel. I'll give you guys the mic so you can answer that. Okay. Anything? All right, yes, your question. Hi, I'm Karen Howard from Mental Health America, and I was, uh, we are actually co-hosting a briefing next week, which we'll talk about firefighters suicide. And we wanted to um, just ask and see if there were, um, from, from your experience, uh, either data or anecdotal um, evidence of um, firefighters, um, their access to firearms, and the higher rates of suicide that we're seeing um, over the last couple of years um, in the communities. And even firefighters have reached out to me and my organization um, asking for help with some of the burnout, stress, and other um, mental health conditions that they may be going through um, with respect to personnel issues. So um, do you have any thoughts about or data about um, firefighter suicide and potentially the increased access to lethal means? Do you have 
Well, um, I'm, I'm going to speak more about um, things that I've seen in the fire service, especially not even uh, just so much in, in um, the FDNY, but being a, a member of the IABPFF. Um, some of the things that we've seen, especially dealing with suicide and dealing with a lot of issues, we've seen more of an uptake in alcohol and drug abuse, which is leading down to that path. And we, uh, we've uh, been encouraging the FDNY to take a look at some of those things, and they just kicked off off an opiate um, program that they're looking into. But um, we've, we're dealing with a lot of issues with firefighters that are dealing with, especially women and a lot of people of color, we're dealing with discrimination and racism and not knowing what to do with it or how to address it or how the department, the fire departments as a whole are addressing these issues. So a lot of them are turning into a lot of different means that are um, thoughts of suicide and, and drinking alcohol abuse. But I know that just in some of my readings and um, one of the links were included inside of the um, the, uh, the, the um, presentation that I did. Um, there is, uh, I know, more recent update that talks about the suicide rate, because I know back in 2017, the rates of line of duty deaths were less than suicide rates, and I'm pretty sure it was the same thing in 2018 as well. So um, statistically, I don't have the data, but I know just from experiences and talking with people in the fire service, it is a really uh, big concern that we have and, and an issue that has to be addressed. Have the data at hand either. I don't know if Kenny, if you know of him, we certainly can look that up. It's not um, hasn't shown up in our uh, most recent mortality studies, but I think it's probably one of those issues that's a, an increasing problem that we're just going to see more of. So certainly the psychosocial stress factors are are absolutely increasing. So I wouldn't be surprised if we'd see it show up in the data in our future studies. risks uh, with microbes to uh, first responders, but kind of transferring that over to your talk on nurses, uh, how hard is it dealing with, uh, you know, infectious diseases such as uh, the ones that uh, the colonel mentioned uh, when they come into an emergency room? In the emergency room, we are one of the largest intake throughout the hospital, so anything essentially could walk through the doors. Um, as nurses, we try our best to use personable, personal equi pe protective equipment, um, like gloves, and we hand out masks in the waiting room. But essentially, as my role as a triage nurse, when I'm intaking patients and asking them questions, you know, I am essentially at risk of whatever is walking through the door. But we, as, as healthcare professionals and pro providers, you know, take on that risk. And as, as the Colonel was referencing, I think the, the duty that we feel on the call to serve is, is a risk that we're willing to accept as providers. But we try our best to, you know, use gloves when we're, we're working with patients and hand out masks in the waiting room to help de decrease the spread of disease. But there is, there is a risk at being a first, first responder. So you never know what's going to walk through the door and what you're going to interact with. And sometimes you don't know until much later on that that person was carrying something or that you were exposed. And I've had many, many colleagues and many friends that have had to go on HIV prevention medication or hepatitis me prevention medication because they were exposed to certain, to certain risks. So um, it's... It, you know, it, it's kind of the, the risk that, that we assume, but we, we see our, our greater good as a, as a more meaningful purpose. Anything to add, Colonel? Can't add to that. Great response. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, um, please join me in thanking our esteemed panel here today. <laughs> Especially for our co-chairs, Congressman Mullen and Payne Jr. If your boss is interested in joining the Men's Health Caucus, please do reach out to Taylor Hiddle from Congressman Mullen's office or Stephen Schultz from Congressman Payne Jr.'s office. Our panel will be here for a few more minutes uh, in case you have any specific questions you want to ask them. Aside from that, I see there's a few more bags of lunches back there, so if you didn't grab one when you, were, uh, when you first got here, then uh, grab one on your way out. Thank you so much.